thank you for joining for this session so what we are planning in this is to have a candid discussion on various contemporary spiritual topics so today we will be thinking of discussing on the corona crisis as a pointer to basically unnatural living and the corona crisis so we will talk about this in my understanding in three parts one is is there some unnatural living that we might be doing which has caused it is there some unnatural living that we are doing that we can uh, change so that we can prevent the recurrence of such events even if we can't say establish a causal connection and how much is this just beyond the way we are living it is beyond human control and we are just uh, victims so is unnatural living the cause is stopping unnatural living going to be the cure or is our living whatever way is it irrelevant to uh, the occurrence of this crisis so <clears throat> at a time like this when we when suddenly within the matter of months the whole world has been brought down to a standstill it jolts us out of our comfort and complacency and at one level crisis trigger some immediate action but they also stimulate ultimate contemplation immediate action in terms of okay if somebody doesn't have medical mask somebody doesn't have food an immediate action has to be done to deal with that at the same time not everybody is in the crisis where they need some immediate action to deal with the issue so then for most people it's an opportunity for contemplation on bigger truths on ultimate realities so there is a, <clears throat> that question that you know are we so powerless as to be just victims of an invisible entity a virus is supposed to be so tiny that not only is it invisible to us humans but actually it is invisible it would be invisible even to bacteria which themselves are invisible to us so such a tiny being has brought us uh, uh, to a state of panic and almost powerlessness so is this a reflection on something that we may be doing wrong which we can correct so what what would you like to say on this uh yeah so this this could very well uh, reflect the world view which uh, humanity under the leadership of mainly politicians or scientists or a combination of them over the last few hundred years and i am also trying to find out whether uh, like today wikipedia can give you a whole understanding of a timeline of pandemics and i think some of us found out that something happened in 1720 then 1820 and 1920 and 2020 so obviously 1720 we didn't have so much of ozone layer depletion or factory farming or the kind of corruption whatever we have perhaps political corruption could be but at least there was the world was not industrialized so obviously there seems to be something beyond uh, just what we see around us uh, i'll just give i'll just briefly touch this one point and uh, uh, leave you to take it further more i was reading the bhagavad uh, the shrimad bhagavatam 12th canto and uh, bhumi geet is the third chapter where she talks about she talks about how arrogant kings are trying to exploit her to tell you the truth i was trying to see whether any parasite virus or any pandemic is mentioned there <laughs> but it it just uh, talks about pollution it says that kali yuga 
So basically, the Bhagavatam takes this view that Kali Yuga means everything is highly polluted. Now, with just that clue, how do we remove this pollutants and what exactly could be a pollutant B? So since uh, there are now doctors, there is, there is something called paleovirology. That means whether viruses existed even in the ancient times. So taking that clue, I would say that Srimad Bhagavatam takes it to this subtle thought level as to what could be a pollutant thought. And uh, not to put too much of a point, uh, but the fact is that to, to have disregard for nature's laws and to feel that I can do whatever I want and still I can wrest a solution from material nature. That is, that is one point where I feel that uh, you're heading for this was a disaster waiting to happen, which means that given the fact that we could be close to a vaccine in 22 months, and let's say by the year 2026, COVID-19 is passe, it is history. There is no trace of any contagion on planet Earth. But we could be still having, due to our lifestyle, paving the road for another visit by some other virus in the hundred years where you and me surely won't be there um, if we survive COVID-19, of course. <laughs> but, but the understanding is, um, I'm trying to take this view as to what can we learn? And are there natural laws which are being flouted? Now laws are laws. If we, if we have disregard for them, and just like in our material laws, if it says no parking, which means no parking, mm. and there is a fine. So is there something like this which we have done? Uh, and so this, is, this could be, as you, as you rightly said, a disaster waiting to happen. It could be just be a reaction just waiting to happen and uh, what we can learn from that. So yeah. your thoughts on this now. Yeah. So paleovirology has it been able to find out anything where virus is there in the remote past? Or Not exactly. Direction? They're just trying to okay. They're just trying to see whether like paleobotany, there is botany, but then you find fossilized things and try to find out whether there could be anything we can learn. So they're trying to see whether are there patterns. The one thing is for sure, the behavior of COVID-19 is completely uh, like stumping them royally. They cannot predict it. They cannot catch the pattern of the uh, protein and how exactly and why is it so aggressive? Yeah. It's, it is, it's almost like there is a, the, the only scriptural comparison coming to my mind is when uh, Bali coming, uh, seeing Sugriva is again calling him for a combat. Uh, Tara tells him how come somebody who was timidly uh, behaving and defeated by you a few days ago, what is the strength that is making him call you out again? Is there somebody who's backing him? <laughs> That's it's a, a, it's, <laughs> it's a far-fetched thing, but this is what I feel that we, we had, uh, like people in America, they say we have flu season every year. And it is a mutational yeah. virus. So every year our scientists are so expert in mapping it, understanding it, being prepared for it before the season begins. And, uh, and that's it. And only the few who are unprepared or unlucky, they die. But they are not ready for something like this, which is a surprising element. That is Just true. to share something on this. Just one point, it seems that if the speaker is speaking and they, the speaker operates the screen and if, if they remove the screen then zoom the sound becomes mm, distorted so if you want to look for something maybe while i am speaking you can look for it and then later on you can speak it while speaking if you if you are not on the computer while speaking it seems your audio gets blurred 
I have had that. I experience. see. Okay. So, two things. Generally, whenever things go wrong, we basically have two options. One is the world is a terrible place, and that's why this has happened to me, or this is happening to us, or there is something that I am doing wrong and in some way that has caused this and I can fix it or I can change that wrong and in some way it may fix it. So the, the first world view is it might help us just feel like a victim and there is some amount of uh, perverse joy in feeling that I am a, I am a blameless victim of an unfair world. But it's also very disempowering. So we could have, if we consider that, if there is, maybe there is something which I am doing that might be causing this. So then, although it makes us, it can make us feel burdened or guilty, but it can also empower us with a sense of agency. That not just the agency to do what it takes right now to deal with the crisis, whether it is so social distancing or whether it is if we are a part of the medical force, uh, then we act in that way. But beyond that, humanity can get a sense of agency if we consider at least the possibility that maybe there is something we are doing which is which needs to be fixed. So if we consider this second perspective. And humility will have us admit that the universe is too complicated for us to definitely reject, to definitely either arrive at one perspective or the other. That, uh, that the, everything is happening, just the universe is a, is a hostile place or the universe is in some ways reciprocal. So if we, from the perspective of just self-empowerment, if we consider a second perspective, then we can compare ourselves with history and see what we could be doing wrong, which has caused this, what we could fix it. And there, there is an increasing awareness of environmental consciousness. And uh, sometimes any good ideology can also be taken to an extreme level, where sometimes there are uh -huh. there are the word uses eco fundamentalists mm. so there are eco fundamentalists who say that this is nature's revenge on us this is the environment's revenge on us for the way we have exploited it for the way we have disrupted ecological balances for the way we have caused climate change we have caused the er er eradication of biodiversity now for those who subscribe to that ideology uh, I'm not using the word in a negative sense, but for those who are environmentally conscious, that might be a reasonable explanation. But uh, for others, it can seem that you're just using the environmental, uh, you're using the current crisis to promote your environmentalist agenda. So if we try to avoid foisting any agenda, at objective level, we can't correlate this particular crisis with, say, climate change. It, is it that because the temperature has risen? Is it because the uh, because the pollution because the air pollution is more that the coronavirus is spreading? We can't really correlate that way. So, as far as the cause is concerned, a certain amount of humility is required because even in our scripture, if we see when Srimad Bhagavatam is uh, discussing in the first canto, when a cow and bull are being beaten, and the King Parikshit asks, what is the cause of your suffering? So at one level, the cause of suffering, there is this demoniac person, Kali, beating him. But the mm. bull says, actually the cause of suffering is very difficult to assert. So there is a certain amount, when there is huge amount of evil, a huge amount of suffering, there is some amount of epistemological uncertainty about the cause of evil. And that is a matter of humility, which is seen in our tradition also. So rather than focusing on the cause of the problem, 
is there something we can do to cure the problem not just in the immediate sense but in the long term sense so one thing we could correlate at this stage is that there are there are hardly any diseases that are caused through the eating of vegetarian food so we don't have rice disease or uh, or wheat disease or something like that we but we have mad cow disease we have swine flu and the uh, widely accepted hypothesis about how the coronavirus came into the human beings is through the wet market in wuhan so if we consider that whenever there are if there's any genetic mutation happens so the coronavirus has been pre- present for a long time in other species but through a mutant mutation it came into the bats and from the bats somebody probably consumed the bat and from there it came into human beings that's the most probable pathway that has been traced right now so it could have been through not necessarily physical consumption it could have been also in contact but the idea is that it seems a lot of diseases are associated with the the consumption of flesh consumption of meat and not just the consumption of meat but the the extreme destruction of uh, fauna of animal life for the sake of uh, satisfying the human urge for meat if we consider that today factory farms which is a euphemism for slaughter houses and their millions and millions of animals are harvested to be slaughtered and this is definitely unnatural even if we agree that meat has been a part of human diet across the history and geography and we humans have been given canine teeth by which we can eat meat but not all our teeth are canine and our teeth are not like carnivorous animals so in history meat has been a one part of the human diet and meat has not been a staple of the human diet where it is had constantly and not for all of humanity and certainly never before has humanity systematically cultivated animals to be slaughtered so that the so that we can have them for food consumption in fact the a number of animals slaughtered every year if we include the fish and everything it's more than the population of humanity itself so this is definitely something unnatural so even from a overall perspective we can say this is something which is radically we are doing different from what was done earlier and from a immediate causal perspective we can see that this is a pathway through which many diseases are coming upon us so we could say maybe this unnatural thing which we are doing uh, excessive meat consumption if we decrease that we could we could even from a immediate perspective decrease or cut off one channel through which uh, uh, through which pathogens uh, come into the human system yeah that those are my few thoughts on this issue yeah just to add a few things i also read somewhere that uh, okay let's begin with this i also agree that uh, whenever we talk with people who are feeling that uh, why should you impose your food choice on us if you are vegetarians lacto vegetarians or whatever why should uh, we be deprived of meat because we just like it so even a cursory understanding of world scriptures now i primarily say that because don't eat this don't eat that doesn't primarily come from the science book because right now the chinese government is saying don't eat cats don't eat dogs 
but that's not like a religious edict. It is not a, it is just that if you eat them, you will be spreading COVID-19. So, so sometimes these people may concur with what religious scriptures are saying, but that be, that's be, only because it's an emergency now. So mostly scriptures talk of compassion and uh, we have to, like they may allow some animals to be eaten, but they also in a bigger picture tell that you should love other animals, you should have pity on them. Even some of the most diehard carnivore diet promoting religions, they have examples of, Jesus is called like, uh, he's called a sacrificial lamb, but he also is shown as very compassionate to everyone. St. Francis is shown as compassionate to all the animals in the forest, so on and so forth. So when you compare that word of compassion to the factory farm today, now this is something which people have to understand. The inhumane conditions in which pigs or chicken are raised, it is a proven fact that these animals always have, I mean, they have totally lived their days in fear and terror, which lowers their immunity. And when we consume that product, we are finding that we are also losing our immunity. So in one sense, just for the sake of satisfying your palate, you're also taking a toll of your own immunity. And just like our Indian proverbial Sheikh Chilli, Sheikh Chilli was given the task of cutting the branch of a tree. And he thought that what is the best way other, uh, other than to sit on the same branch because it's very advantageous. So he's sitting on a branch and he's cutting the branch from its connection with the main trunk. And when he falls and breaks his bones, he says, I mean, what bad luck or my stars are bad or somebody willed bad for me or is it, uh, you know, who's to be blamed? So we need to take a hard look at our food choices, our lifestyle choices, our worldview choices in order to take uh, a stock of such a pandemic as we have today. Yes. I was just looking for some statistics which I had found. So it seems that more than 200 million animals are killed for food every day. And if we consider wild caught and farm fishes, then the daily total is 3 billion animals killed. So 3 billion killed every day. And the human population is around 8 billion? 7.5, so to say. So it's almost uh, one third of the entire humanity is being killed by humanity every day. I don't think any time in human history, uh, even when we were, even if majority of humanity was at one time hunting, we would never have killed this many people. So it's, it's brutal. And as you said that uh, there are multiple threads of thought which can point in this direction. That one is the humane aspect, the other is the health aspect, as you talked about there being low immunity and it's not just a subjective thing. It's quite well documented that, uh, that animals who grow in natural settings, they live healthier. And say, for example, cows, we know that when they are in a natural setting, they give milk, which is, uh, they give more milk and they give healthier milk. And their milk is an indication of their overall state of being. So if we are doing factory farming, we are also in this, we are not only causing suffering to animals, not only are we providing potential pathways for pathogens to come into our body, but otherwise also we are consuming food that is unhealthy. And it's unfortunate that these practices are stopped only when, first of all, a epidemic or in today's case, a pandemic comes and then suddenly we realize that maybe I have to trace back all my steps, something, something like a mathematical equation. At a particular stage, you should be arriving close to the answer. And when you know that you are far off, 
it's not that particular stage of a quantity equation that you have to sort it out. You have to go back to the mm -hmm. first step itself because that first step had something which kept on compounding the error and now you are so far away from your desired objective. Mm. Yes, this first step is very well put. There are, say, if some aliens came to this planet, almost all the Asian fiction that is there in movies or whatever, the aliens themselves are of, maybe of various forms. Some of them may be, very few of them are, are depicted as humans just like us. But whatever forms they may be, the default assumption in all alien fiction is that when they come to Earth, they interact with human beings. So we presume that we are the human, that we humans alone matter on the Earth. But that yeah. presumption itself is open to question. And it is that presumption that we cannot live in our own self-created ecosystem independent of the fragile biosphere of which we are a part. So till now we have been taking, taking, taking from that biosphere and we live in our own world but we don't uh, think that that can intrude upon us and that can affect us. But now we are seeing that it does affect us in various ways and it can, it can overpower us at times. So there is a school of thought called as anthropocentrism, which holds that anthropos is human. Centrism is that we are the center of the center of existence or actually center of the earth. So we have operated, whether it is through a, through a Judeo-Christian worldview, which considers humans alone are to be delivered, or subsequently a, a scientifically driven uh, worldview of colonialism or, or whatever it might be. It might be communism, fascism, but the whole idea is the earth is there for us, for our taking. And that worldview has had its, uh, the toll is that we've just exploited the earth. So maybe we need to consider the earth doesn't belong, that we alone don't matter on the earth. And we need to live more cooperatively with the other species on the earth. Otherwise, there will yeah. be action. Two things, one from a strictly Hare Krishna devotional point of view, Somebody sent me a picture of the mother of uh, the river Yamuna. It never appeared so glistening black. Yes. And uh, her name is Kalindi. So, so for the first time, we saw how she looked in her pristine beauty, maybe a few decades ago. Mm. And all her previous pristine glory. And people from Jalandhar could see a view of the Himalayas which is say 200 or 250 miles away or kilometers away just because of no industrial pollution. So since like a hard choice for 21st century humanity, that why are we working so hard? Why are we neglecting environmental care? Because there is an economic price to be paid for it. But right now with trillions of economic dollars being lost, we are not, our hearts and minds are not occupied with that. Now basic survival is at stake. Mm. So George Monbiot is a guardian columnist and he wrote a column saying that all the horror movies were wrong. Like horror movies show how contagion spreads, viruses spread, and then people start becoming very selfish. But he is, uh, in his column, he is drawing that people are willing to give away whatever extra food they have. There are people who are delivering groceries at the doorsteps of elderly people who cannot understand the whole situation or go out and do something. So we are a caring lot. It is just that those thoughts or 
the 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 idea of a caring mind gets attacked by the virus of exploitation and a physical virus when it invades us Ooh. somehow that internal mental virus gets vaccinated and the good thoughts come about like <laughs> beautiful like i i need to share uh, somebody somebody showed me a small picture where an italian old person was uh, told that so now you have been declared covid negative you can go back and uh, since you were here everything is free but we had to buy, we had to rent outside ventilator so that would be 500 dollars for your ventilator charges only and he starts crying and the medical people are thinking are you worried that you cannot pay therefore you are crying he said no i am 76 years old and all these years i just took the free oxygen which nature sent and she has not sent a bill beautiful it's moving actually this is just one thought i had that there is the there is the rigidly evolutionary world view which says that we are driven we are basically survival machines so we just live to survive now humanity itself is we we have we do want to survive but there is survival value and there is there are things that have survival value and there are things that bring value to survival yeah things that bring value to survival so now both matter but unfortunately in today's world we are caught neither here nor here we are caught in superficial things so okay what is the next movie being released who is going to who is going to become the who is going to win this elections or who is going to win this lottery it's a superficiality is that we normally get caught in they belong they actually don't have any survival value nor do they bring any value to our survival so when the superficiality is taken away then we focus on this on survival value and value to survival so if we don't look at the things that bring value to our survival then we just get caught in this uh, bestial struggle for survival so without mm -hmm. a higher purpose or without a higher meaning uh, the animal side within us comes out and then adversity can can actually bring out the worst in people or it can bring out the best in people so if if we don't go to think about what brings value to my survival then it is blindly focus on getting things that bring our survival value then it can bring out the worst but it can actually bring out the best and not just in and that best can be not just in terms of caring for valuing the gifts of nature as this gentleman said that i have been taking oxygen from nature for so long it can be caring for our neighbors it can also be thinking about the ultimate questions of life what we uh, what, what really counts in life what are we what is our life meant for and in that way this can prompt some spiritual inquiry about how we can ultimately belong to the universe in a in a more harmonious and healthy way so uh, you want to say something about that or should i move ahead no 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 yeah, i'm just yeah we will begin with three core points so we haven't covered them yet right yeah we talked about the cause is there something there is a cause there is a cure and is there no correlation so i started okay. by saying that if there's no correlation that's a very disempowering world view so we can't really and that's not provable that there is no correlation absolutely empowering is that there might be some correlation between our actions now in a linear one to one causal way we can't find it out 
but in terms of what can we do to cure we discussed from various angles that first is not only is to decreasing less animal consumption or decreasing our animal uh, consumption but also in terms of considering the higher values of life so that can be a part of the cure immediately as well as in the long term okay um, so just going back to that earlier point when i said that we pres- that in all alien fiction humans are said the to be the ones that matter uh but it's ironic that uh, if we consider there's the left and there's the right and often the left is quite quite uh, liberal and environmentally conscious and li- uh, the right sometimes even has extreme rights who are climate change deniers who say this is just a exaggerated thing but one finding which the left often presents is that this is among other biologists eo wilson has said that every species on the earth contributes to the ecolo- contributes to the ecological balance except for one species and that is a human species so we disrupt the ecological balance and we don't seem to contribute in any way and there are, i've seen right wing think they say this is a horrendously misanthropic statement so what are you suggesting that humanity should annihilate itself so that ecology should live is it that no it, it is the it is worse than it is a mentality that is worse than genocidal it is almost omnicidal that kill all of humanity so there is uh, there is one harvard biologist do you know that he has this doctrine that we should all commit suicide only then in the world will be peaceful and happy <laughs> okay that actually says that that's interesting so then i was thinking that from the bhagavatam's perspective in the 11th canto there is a interesting passage that the lord creates all living beings and finally he creates humans who have the capacity for spiritual inquiry for inquiry about the purpose of existence and then after creating humans the lord of all beings becomes satisfied so the the narrative flow within this suggests that humans exist to pursue a higher purpose beyond mere survival that our the purpose of the way we contribute to the ecology is by pursuing the a uh, life of ultimate meaning that what uh, that is there something spiritual something enduring some lasting aspect of life and if we don't use our faculties if we say that means the purpose of human life is not just to get the things that have survival value but to inquire about the things that bring ultimate value to our survival so to the extent we don't do this the things that bring value to our survival then we get obsessed with superficial things and even the things that are, are having survival value they also we may we may binge over them and we may create problems for ourselves by that so for example food is a necessity but when there is no higher purpose to life then we don't eat we don't we don't eat to live we live to eat and then people don't even live to eat sometimes we may we eat in such a way that our uh, there are there are nutritionists who say that people are actually committing suicide with their forks the way we are eating so that higher purpose is if we inquire about it then that can lead to a significant elevation of human consciousness there is a uh very significant in the in the history of the environmental movement one of the leaders he gave a speech to the religious and spiritual leaders of the world and he said that initially when the data uh, data about the about the grave nature of the environmental apocalypse that was awaiting us was came forward we felt that if we just educate people more and more about this then people will desist from uh, from 
high energy or high environmental expense kind of behavior but that has not happened and he said that what we need now is that there has to be a cultural and spiritual transformation within human being so that they will live in a more harmonious way and this so he says that science doesn't know how to do that that is a very beautiful quote he says science doesn't know how to bring about a cultural and spiritual transformation in people uh, how to change the driving values and purposes of people that that guy the religious and spiritual leaders of the world have a very important role to play in preserving the environment and other prominent uh, uh, thinker he said that we need to cultivate a less materialistic live, lifestyle based on an ethos of non material enrichment so non material enrichment basically will come when we start looking for things that bring value and meaning and purpose to our survival and then we don't crave after the other things so to the extent uh, if, if if people can have a more meaningful and purposeful life then even the craving for various superficial things that have a high carbon footprint and even for the indiscriminate consumption of meat that can be decreased uh there is something which i read and uh, i i was fascinated by that treating this whole world or even the whole material experience at the university so there are students from kindergarten level right up to phd level and post phd you go out and do something in the outside world like you graduate so if human beings are at the phd level students and all the animals are kind of we see man as dominion we can control them we call them dumb animals we call somebody who's done a very uh, bad thing brutal so brute is a is an animal animalistic behavior bestial all our adjectives are we point a finger at them so if humans start looking at other animals as undergrad students or high school students or school students and we were also like them slowly slowly we are now here now our job is to finish our studies and graduate and while doing so we also help them in their process of slowly uh, evolving spiritually we are not talking just of the bodily level evolution so the the fascinating part about this analogy is after this college my life actually begins i need to do something out there when that prospect is not there then why do i care whether i preserve this university or whether i like like the 1960 saw the anarchist students in universities they were so frustrated by their professors they gave a world view which was simply nihilistic and it was full of bleak there is nothing this life is meaningless everything is meaningless so if everything is meaningless why should we preserve something and then the gita kind of warns the mode of ignorance takes over and one of the pleasures of the mode of ignorance is to destroy the pleasures of mode of passion is to somehow preserve uh so uh, passion is to create and mode of goodness is to preserve something but unless the shuddha sattva the transcendental kind of star on the horizon doesn't appear this is where we have to go so in our stage why should we like uh, it is funny but the most popular youtube videos on or instagram videos or tiktok videos are about cats jumping from the roofs or cats or dogs showing behavior just uh, akin to human children so somewhere deep down below there is this feeling that these animals are also part of my life but right now that that wisdom is lacking as to how do i respect them 
how do i take care of them in the western world you will find people lavishing dogs have their own saloons dogs have their own weight loss clinics does it mean that people love animals they love animals only if they serve them in a one particular way so it's not like an enlightened world view about animals it's a very narrow it's a niche kind of thing so that love always is like love the dog at the cost of a pig or a cow the cow also is loved but because she gives me her flesh to eat and a dog also is loved because he jumps at me and licks my face when i come home so we haven't yet dislodged human beings from the big pedestal of rulers or conquerors caesars or uh, whatever samrats of the world only when human beings step down from that and see everybody as a cooperator i i need i do need like we always see these uh, statistics about a, a, a honey bee goes 15 kilometers for a few grams of honey and when she doesn't even taste it so today's education today's culture doesn't make me stop on my tracks why is she contributing so much who told her this is your role and only when because of so much of mobile phone technology and everything we find honey bees missing we find it is not just honey which is uh, going low in stocks in the grocery stores but a whole flora fauna is affected just because one link in the chain becomes weak so i think that this kind of lockdown time may give at least a few thinking people that much needed respite and the ability to go inward understand what our role is and uh, hopefully something good just like the himalayas becoming very clear and just a pleasing sight to behold or just as the jamuna again becoming a pleasant sight to behold something good can come out of this i pray hope and think we can do something like that and that is the sense which can give all of us a sense of agency that if we make some micro changes then something good can emerge from nature and the beauty of nature that is manifesting at a particular level in the terms of the cleansing of the rivers that is uh, indication that maybe we can move in this direction right now we are forced to move but maybe we can voluntarily move after the kind of current forcible to shut down is there there is there is something called as a uh, intentional degrowth we are all talking about <laughs> growing 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 but maybe we need to consider that we need to grow more holistically so thank you very much for this thank stimulating you. discussion thank you thank you